Good morning, I'm Joyce Coleman. I'm the executive director of the Vas Gladys Foundation. And I would just like to say thank you for coming today. We love to put on these meetings and um, it's so nice to see you in person and then to also like to welcome everyone who's watching online. Um, so at this time, we are going to have the patient's perspective. And the goal of this session is to try to help you understand how can you work with your team, your physicians at home, how can you be better at being patients and working with them so that they can be better physicians. So at this time, I'd like to ask the panel to introduce themselves, and then we'll move to the Q&A. Thank you, Joyce. Uh, I'm Andrew Sulich. I'm in uh, private practice in St. Clair Shores Rheumatology, and I just realized I got to get an updated picture. <laughs> That's my Tinder picture, right? <laughs> right. right. Sorry about that. Okay. Dr. Paris. Okay. So uh, I'm uh, Glenn Paris. I'm a rheumatologist. Uh, I'm in private practice. We have offices in Lawrenceville, uh, Lilburn, and Swanee, Georgia. I uh, trained at Emory. Uh, I've been in practice for about 27 years. Um, and uh, we have a fairly large uh, Bichette's um, uh, cohort in my practice. Uh, we have about 25 patients, 20, 25 patients active at any time. Probably total, we've probably seen about uh, 30, 30 plus Bichette's patients. Um, and uh, they are very challenging to first diagnose and then sometimes to treat. Um, I wish I photographed as well as Dr. Sulich. <laughs> I'm, I'm old and gray, and uh, as far as fashion is concerned, my, my daughter on social media is probably changing her last name right now. So uh, she's, she's uh, he's definitely ahead of me on several things. Great. Thank you. And Dr. Micheletti? Uh, so I, my name is Robert Micheletti. I'm a dermatologist uh, and internist at University of Pennsylvania. And my practice is uh, what we call complex medical dermatology. So I focus on autoimmune skin disease, um, basically skin disease that uh, is associated with internal issues. So that's, that's what I focus on. And I work closely with the uh, very dedicated group of um, rheumatologists there at the University of Pennsylvania who focus on vasculitis. So I actually have a vasculitis clinic in my practice and uh, have the, the, for the good fortune of working with um, uh, quite a few patients who have vasculitis or Bichette disease, so. Great, thank you. Well, I just wanna say thank you to all of you before we even start for making time today to be with us. We can't do these meetings without the physicians. Um, so we just appreciate them giving up their weekend to help us, or day. Not weekend, weekend, we didn't say it. <laughs> thank you. So one thing we wanted to do was, who's in the audience today? Um, so I was wondering if you're newly diagnosed in the last two years, um, if you wanted to raise your hands. We're just trying to get an idea of who's here. Great, thanks. And then um, who's had a diagnosis, say, from three to five years? Okay, and then six to 10? Okay, um, 11 to 15? Okay, and great, and 15 and more? Great, thank you so much. Okay, so we're gonna move to the Q&A session. And these are questions that were submitted when people registered online. And so we chose the questions that were the most, um, that were asked actually submitted the most. So I'm gonna start and we'll just go through them. And um, if you have any questions or need anything, let me know. So the first question was, many patients see multiple specialists to treat, to treat each seemingly unrelated manifestation of the disease. And how do you make the initial connection with Bechette's? Who wants to start? Well, I'm just throwing my hand in the ring here. Uh, a lot of times um, when you're dealing with Bechette's disease, it's like watching a bunch of blind men describing an elephant. You know, uh, the guy on the side says an elephant is wide and broad and flat. And you know, the guy who's feeling the, the trunk, you know, you know, the elephant is thick and long. And then you know, the guy who's, you know, is in the back, you know, you know, short and skinny. You know, and, and they're all looking at it from their perspective. Um, Bichette's disease doesn't always happen all at the same time. You can get these oral ulcers and um, you know, uh, herpes simplex one is very common. 
it's often dismissed that way. It's chased with um, uh, antivirals frequently, and they just don't work, but they go into remission spontaneously after a few days or a week or two. Uh, and that's what a lot of people, I think, um, run through uh, in the initial um, uh, uh, period of their disease if it starts with oral ulcers. Um, genital ulcers are one of those things that um, most uh, patients, particularly female patients, don't talk about with their interns. They might talk about it with their um, gynecologist, but a lot of times it just gets passed over with a family doctor or cardiologist or ENT or, or whatever. You know, it just doesn't seem to be um, uh, salient to that kind of a visit. Um, by the time you get to a rheumatologist, we're really looking at the whole person, and um, you know, we're, we're putting together things that are subtle, like oral ulcers, genital ulcers, then we start asking other questions. You have any eye problems? Yeah, I can't stand headlights or bright light. Um, I get these vicious headaches, and you know, I, I don't do well with um, phlebotomy, and every time they, they do this, I get these weird bruises that bubble up. I mean, you know, they, they, they describe these things because they don't, you know, a lot of times the patient coming in doesn't know how to describe pathogy. They don't know how to describe enteritis. They don't know how to describe uveitis. They don't know how to describe um, uh, meningoencephalitis. They they don't under, they can't describe these, these symptoms except in basic uh, terms, and then it's, it's, a, it's often a matter of degree. And uh, you know, if they describe severity, uh, it's often taken as um, exaggeration. So it's, it's, it's a difficult um, thing for a patient to communicate um, as doctors are really you know, conditioned um, to respond to buzzwords. You know, oral ulcers, genital ulcers, meningoencephalitis, we, we hear these terms and we think, ah, you know, if you give me that, I'm gonna get it. But if you give me you know, bad headaches or migraine headaches, it's like, so what? I can try to answer the question from the perspective of one of these other specialists, because I think you know, the rheumatologist really is the, the home base um, for, for a patient with Bichette's disease, um, generally speaking. From a dermatologic perspective, um, and again, I said I'm, this is what I am interested in, this kind of, this kind of disease where the skin manifestation may tell us something about what else is going on. You know, I'm always approaching things from that lens. You know, is this sort of run-of-the-mill acne or folliculitis, or is there something more going on? And so I'm already, always thinking of it that way. But the simple fact is that you know the vast majority, um, many many times more common, is going to be run-of-the-mill folliculitis or run-of-the-mill acne. And so, uh, as a patient, what's helpful. Uh, for, for us uh, physicians is that um, if you think that there's, if there's something else going on, you know, sort of getting to what you said, you know, you're not sure if it's related um, and you're not sure if you should mention it, um, I, I would suggest, I would, I would uh, encourage you to mention it because, um, you know, if I then have, I might hopefully ask you about some of those symptoms, but, um, but if you're telling me, you know, I also get these genital ulcers, or I also get these, uh, the, these joint symptoms, et cetera, um, then that's going to help us with some of those buzzwords, help us to, to sort of jog our, our memory to think about, um, you know, maybe there's more going on here than just what meets the surface. So I think um, we, you know, modern medicine is very subspecialized and very siloed, and so getting everybody to communicate is a struggle. Um, and, and ultimately, you want to have that kind of home base person who's going to help kind of help you sort of um, bring it all together. Um, but what you can do when you see your provider over here, um, even though it seems what it, the other stuff that's going on seems unrelated to what they're treating you for, it, it certainly doesn't hurt to at least mention. And I, I think you know, at least putting the information out there, um, th then the physician can can incorporate it in and, and hopefully um, get you to the right diagnosis and to the right treatment. The differential of mouth ulcers is very vast, and even if you have an associated illness with them, like for instance, if you have inflammatory bowel disease, I've seen patients with Crohn's disease that have mouth ulcers. I've seen patients with lupus that have mouth ulcers. So we got to be careful that sometimes that you know the rheumatologist who is trained in uh, you know traditional rheumatology and sees these kind of patients, along comes somebody else that has mouth ulcers that doesn't quite fit the mold. You, got, you can't force a diagnosis, and I think sometimes that happens in, in clinical practice. We see something, oh, this is inflammatory bowel disease, must be Crohn's ulcer colitis, that's your diagnosis. So we've got to be careful. So unless you're not thinking your background, this is somewhat atypical. It doesn't quite fit. If it doesn't quite fit, it's like I did a puzzle with my kids because uh, we had a power failure, so all the phones were off. So we did a puzzle, actually. And if you don't, and I was trying to force the puzzle pieces because I want to I get it done. Uh, and you, you cannot force the puzzle pieces. And sometimes patients are anxious. They want, I want a diagnosis. What's going on with me? You say, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. But if it just doesn't quite fit, 
you just basically have to just follow the patient along or you go and talk to your subspecialist, your gastroenterologist, or you talk with your dermatologist or ophthalmologist. Is this a strange presentation? What's the biopsy results of the colon? What's the biopsy of the skin? What, what do you think is going on here? That's really the key thing because there are many of you people that have bichettes live in that gray area and you can't really make that, force that diagnosis. Great, thank you. So here's a question. At the time of diagnosis, what are the current odds that any given patient one will experience significant complications from Bechet's, two, live reasonably well with occasional flare-ups, or three, go into complete remission? Who's got the crystal ball? Yeah. <laughs> Somebody's got it. Uh, I'm looking for lottery tickets, but I can't see it, so that's my crystal ball. Yeah, we don't know. That's the hard part. I think that, you know, it's very frustrating when somebody comes in and says, we can prognosticate certain diseases in the rheumatological field. I can tell you this, this, and this is going to happen. I can't do that. Uh, on the one hand, I think that it's, it's for us, we're not going to over-treat you. On the other hand, we don't want to under-treat you. And that's really where the frustration happens is, can you treat me so I don't get this? Well, sometimes the medications that we use have their side effects. So we're going to be very careful with that. So I know it's frustrating in the beginning to say, what's going to happen to me? If you go by generalities, like I mentioned before, the kind of Turkish Bichette syndrome, a young male that presents, yeah, they tend to have worse prognosis. But that's just one factor from looking at populations. It's not looking at individuals. You're an individual that comes sees me. So I'm really uncomfortable by beginning to speculate and say, oh, you won't get this or you will get this. Well, I said, this is the thing to watch for, and this is why in the beginning, you're gonna be intensely followed, and I hopefully over time, this is not gonna manifest itself. The first um, a Bichette's patient I took care of was back in the early 1990s, and it was a, a young man, he was in his early 20s, African-American, and he was a vet, so I'm at the VA hospital. And he'd had uh, meningoencephalitis brain disease uh, with Bichette's, and um, he had seizures and a stroke, and had recurrent oral ulcers. Um, you know, I took care of him for a couple of years there, and, and then he followed me out into private practice. But, um, you know, you can't really tell who's going to have what. Every once in a while, you get somebody who's got the grand slam. They've got the central nervous system disease, they've got the eye disease, they've got the oral ulcers, they've got the gastrointestinal disease, they've got the uh, arterial and venous uh, vasculopathy, they get the pathogy, they get um, an arthritis, which is frequently a, a um, spondyloarthritis, and, and it's probably, it may have to do with the inflammatory bowel disease component. Uh, but this, this gentleman had the, the full spectrum and had an explanation for every single one. Um, he, uh, he, he thought he had vicious migraine headaches, and that's what they were. And they were atypical migraine headaches because he had focal neurologic uh, manifestations with it. Uh, you know, he happened to be gay, and uh, he was told that he had herpes in the mouth and down below. And he frequently had um, loose bowels, and he thought it was from stress. Uh, he was hospitalized because he was found to have a very large thrombus in his, uh, in his main vein, the vena cava. And I was called in to, to see about him. So I went in, and you know, they thought he had an autoimmune disease, but you know, they'd done several ANA tests, and they were all negative. So I had ordered a number of lab tests and came in to see him the next morning. And one of the nurses at the nurse's station says, you know, she comes up to me, and she's doing gum. Well, Dr. Paris, what's with this patient? I says, well, what do you mean? Every place we draw blood, he's got these pustules. I says, what? And I run down the hall, and I look at him, and I'm thinking, holy crap. Pardon my language. But, but I, this guy has got the grand slam. He's got every manifestation of Bichette's disease. Didn't think of it. I'm concentrating on this, on this uh, 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 big thrombus in his, in his vena cava. But he had everything. And he had explanation for everything, but he had everything. I went back and says, so do you get headaches? Oh, yeah, I get these migraine headaches. So, you know, but when you see this, you know, you know, a rheumatologist is going to pick that up, all right? But when you have somebody with one problem and the others aren't active, he's not going to mention those other things. Why does, he, why does the rheumatologist need to know about my migraine headaches? Why does he have to know about my sexuality? You know, so you know, a lot of these things, don't filter for the doctors. Throw it all out there. And the other thing, and I'm, I'm hogging time here, and I apologize, guys. Um, the other thing that I tell every patient with every doctor, journal, and bring your notes in. And do not be embarrassed about bringing notes in to the doctor. If, if you get somebody who says, oh, jeez, he's got a notebook. So what? <laughs> so what? Bring your notebook. And let anybody make any notes in it for you. Any, you know, when, when your uh, family members, friends observe things that are different, 
you know, let them make suggestions, make a note of it. I'm sorry, pass the time. I don't, I, uh, I can't, it's hard to follow, the, <laughs> follow that, but you know, the only thing I would add really would be um, when I see patients who have a rare disease or especially a chronic one, um, it, that's, a, that's a difficult place to be, right? And I think the best way to describe it is sort of like the Bichette's journey, really. So your journey, you've already been on a journey even before you get the diagnosis, right? And then there's more to come. And you can read about someone else's experience or hear about some of their experience where either it went well or it didn't go well. And that's, again, that's a hard place to be. But I tell patients that, you know, more than half the battle is getting the diagnosis, right? Now you're plugged in with gentlemen like, like this who are going to follow you over time, work with other subspecialists, monitor closely. And if you're unlucky and something develops, you're now in a position to catch it early. You're in a position to manage it properly. And so, yes, the unknown is, is a challenging thing, especially when not everything is known about a disease and we don't have perfect treatments. Um, but that journey, you know, getting the diagnosis, getting plugged in, that is, to me, that's more than half of the way there to getting, it, to getting the good outcome and, and as close to a normal life as possible. So that's how I like to think about it, you know, even if we can't predict for an individual patient. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, um, what tips do you have for, especially for newly diagnosed patients, when talking to family and friends about your disease? But I think this also goes to patients who've had the disease for a few years, and like when the family says, oh, you still have this? And, you know, and you're like, yeah, it's chronic. Um, so what are your thoughts, uh, suggestions for this? Be careful who you talk to about your disease. The first thing, you need to be your own filter with people. Because if you have not someone who is sympathetic uh, and compassionate and fully understanding, you lend yourself to stereotypes. And that's a problem. Oh, these are just mouth ulcers. Oh, you're just depressed because you know, your football team didn't win that way. Or, or you're having joint aches because you're overdoing things. They tend to oversimplify sometimes people. Some people don't even know what Bichette's is. They'll say, but what? You know, they won't even. Then they go on and they say, I had a cousin, and they'll give you kind of tips about what to do, right? And you gotta be very careful out there because there's so much other non-approved agents out there and special, you know, other type of treatments. So I think you gotta be very judicious on who you share this information with about you. The supporting loved ones, yes, but casually on friends is kind of difficult to do. And you shouldn't be put in an, in an excuse because you don't wanna be put in a situation where I have to excuse myself because my disease is active. I, no diabetic does that. If their sugars are high, they're not gonna excuse themselves. So you shouldn't have to be in a situation to have to always be a spokesman to defend yourself. So I always think be careful who you share this information with. And again, it's a personal thing too as well. Always share it with the people that you're obviously with because they need to understand this. And then bring these people to the office with you. So many times I've seen, the only, it's only the patient there. I go, where's your husband or your wife or whatever? Oh, they're not here. I think part of the problem is, is having somebody come with you and they may have questions too. And I think that's the important thing, to, that kind of relationship where I can share it with family members. Very little to add to that. Um, it's important to bring your significant other um, because a lot of times they, they may empathize with you, may be sympathetic to you, they don't understand the disease, and when they try to ask their friends about it, um, it often comes back to, oh yeah, I knew somebody who had those symptoms, and they had lupus. I think your doctor was wrong, and you know, uh, you know, or or um, you know, the Uncle Joe syndrome. You know, my my neighbor's Uncle Joe had just like, and it was cancer. That's what it is, and you need, you know, so you you have to, you know, be wary of those kinds of things. And again, you know, I, I go back to journaling. And the other thing is, um, this is a great tool. For anything that has cutaneous manifestations, take pictures, because they're not always active when you get into the doctor's office. Take pictures and keep journals of those pictures. You know, oral lesions, you know, uh, bright lights, mirror, and a, and a camera phone can be very helpful. Uh, skin lesions, very helpful. Nether regions, very helpful. You know, so, you know, keep that in, uh, around. But, um, you know, you, you've got to gradually collect this information and sort of track it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's helpful just for loved ones to understand what a chronic disease is, that, you know, there's going to be better days, there's going to be worse days, and it's not necessarily predictable. Um, so giving you that latitude is helpful. And then, you know, people who love you are going to want to read about it and understand everything they can. Um, but where, where are they reading? Where are they getting that information from? So 
resources like the American Vestigial Disease Association or the Vascular Foundation, um, or a physician who can help um, filter and um, you know uh, put things in context that you may be reading. So um, just make sure that you know when you finally get that diagnosis, uh, you finally have that. That then you know the temptation is to go out and 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 try to. Um, look at everything, which is good. We want that. We want patients to, who are we like patients to be engaged, um, but uh, but you have to be careful with that as well. And the, and your loved ones, um, uh, you know, have to be careful with that um, as well because uh, it sort of leads to um, sometimes um, inappropriate assumptions about kind of where things may be headed. And if you are, and and the other thing is, if you know how complicated your disease is, if anything sounds simple. Don't walk away, run away. If there's some kind of simplistic treatment out there that works for everybody, for everything, you have to be skeptical. So there's, a, there's an area of skepticism because I know people want to get better. And I realize that, but one of, the, one of the frustrations I get, if it sounds like, oh, my cousin's taking this and it works for them, uh, it's usually alcohol-based too for the cousin. So <laughs> you, know, it's, it, you want to make sure that, no, this sounds way too simple for my complicated disease. And I think that's where it lends itself to a lot of problems down the road. The other thing that I think we haven't mentioned is um, the importance of support groups. Um, you know, I, I think that um, uh, really getting an intimate feeling that you're not alone is important. Um, be careful about support groups, you know, giving you too much advice on treatment because you can't treat every patient the same way. They just don't respond the same way to the same medicines. But just knowing that, you know, you're not alone, that there are other people who have some of your symptoms and uh, people who have other symptoms that you don't have and may never get. But just knowing that it's a very uh, variable, very protein disease that um, is very uncommon, very uncommon, and you're likely not going to run into somebody in the supermarket who has Bichette's disease to talk about. You know, so support groups are, are very important, but they need to be legitimate support groups. And you know, uh, the Bichette's Association is a great place to start. You know, where's a good support group in my area? Great, thank you. Okay, the next question is, um, so how can doctors work with patients, multidisciplinary care team to diagnose and treat Bechet's disease more effectively? So do you have any advice for the care teams that are not part of the same institution or office? And let's take a quick show of hands. How many people have one to five doctors? Six to yeah. 10? <laughs> 11 plus. Mm -hmm. So how, you know, 11 is a football team. So uh, anyway, I'll turn it over to you. But how do patients, how do you manage that? And how do the physicians work together well? Well, that's a two-part question because you talked about diagnosis and then treatment. So on the diagnostic side, if, because you're looking, you have to have physicians that are aware of Bichette's disease because you, part of the time we're looking at make sure it's not something else, and part of the time we're looking for Bichette's. So in a way, you may work in the same healthcare network, but you may have another physician in another network that is a specialist in Bichette's and say we've got GI symptoms, that's the kind of person you want to see. You don't want to tunnel vision your Bichette's, but the point is, if you're looking at the diagnostic side, you have to have enough specialists that are aware of what Bichette's is and some of the clinical and subtle manifestations that they are. So that's on the diagnostic side. On the therapeutic side, once we're all coming to an agreement, then it's nice to have an EHR, that's our electronic health record, but these records don't always communicate. So it, it, it becomes a problem. So what I find with my patients with Bichette's disease, I always tell them, I said, if you want a gastroenterologist, this is a, someone that specializes, you mean I'll also be in your network. Or I may say to the patient, this is a person that is, is a neurologist that, that have seen Bichette's patients before. So sometimes it's not a convenient situation all the doctors come together and they have a meeting about you. That's, it's very, medicine's still very fractionated, especially in private practice. So I think the important part about it is you can go to a Bichette Center, I mean there are centers in the country that you know, cater to Bichette, but that's not always practical for people to drive to New York to do that. So I think that having to know, number one, is screening your specialists. Do they know about Bichette's? Do they know the complications? how they interact, and most of the time now with our EHRs, we're starting to be able to look at other people's notes, but it's still in its infancy. I would say as annoying as it is to keep seeing so many doctors, um, you know, I think it is important uh, at, at the same time to make sure that you're getting that expert input because I certainly have had many situations, whether for Bechette's or for other conditions, where basically after you get that diagnosis, anything that happens on your skin, like from that moment onward, 
is that thing, right? That's the, that's the assumption whenever you have something like this. And that may not be an accurate assumption. It's very, it's helpful for me to be able to say, oh yes, this is compatible with active disease or flaring disease, and we may want to adjust the medications. Or if I can say, no, no, it's, it's actually this other thing. We have, can treat it topically. We don't need to worry and communicate that back to uh, your home base, you know, uh, rheumatologist or whoever else is taking care of you. Um, that's tremendously helpful information can spare you potentially side effects from more aggressive treatments. So, um, so that, you know, those specialists have, have input um, that, that's useful. Um, I think, you know, how can you make sure that communication happens? Well, unfortunately, it comes down sometimes to the doctor sending notes and, and picking up the phone, and, and, and that can be challenging. But, um, you know, I encourage you to, to advocate for yourself. You know, we often have these after-visit summaries at the end of the visit. You know, if we can throw in, like, just our quick and dirty plan, you know, maybe the note's not done, but we just throw in our plan, so that you can take that to the next doctor. Um, if you can remind us, you know, here are the doctors I want you to send a note to. Um, you know, those things are helpful. It just kind of builds uh, the collegia collegiality uh, between, uh, you know, us and your other uh, specialists who are following you so that everybody is all on the same page, which, you know, sounds like it should be sort of taken for granted that everybody should be on the same page, but um, that, that can be a challenging thing. Um, I think that uh, one of the things that, um is important in terms of having a, a, a team of doctors is uh, surveillance. So for the, for the components of your disease that are active or challenging or just resistant to treatment, you, you know, everything that you do you know, gets you a little close but never quite controls it, you, know, you tend to focus on that doctor or that specialty. But um, for the rest of them, the um, ophthalmologist, the, you know, the neurologist, if there's every, any uh, neurologic um, component to it, even if there isn't, you know, get that consult so that you're in the team, you're in that uh, specialty. Uh, gastroenterologists, of course, dermatologists, absolutely. Um, but also sometimes vascular surgeons. Um, and uh, make sure that you have a, um, a medical alert bracelet for Bichette's. So once a year, see the dermatologist. If you have no oral ulcers, no genital ulcers, no pathogy, no acne, no folliculitis, see the dermatologist at least once a year. If you have no gastroenterology um, problems, see the gastroenterologist at least once a year. Surveillance can be very, very important uh, in a disease that's this protean. Great, thank you. So the next question is, what roles can patients play in this process? So how can patients be the quarterback of the team? Um, how can they keep all their doctors informed of ongoing care, medications, and flare-ups? Um, you suggested journaling, taking photographs, um, logging onto their doctor systems. Um, any other thoughts, suggestions? Well, I always am concerned that we sometimes tunnel vision the Bichette's, but we don't understand what other common things that can happen to you. So I may see a young woman in there, let's say, 48 years old, presents with costochondral pain, things from the Bichette's, she may be having a heart attack. We've gotta be careful about not just saying we're treating your Bichette's disease, so don't neglect even the basic physicals, because I think part of the problem is, is that we sometimes get so tunnel vision of the Bichette's, which is, that's what we do, but you have to think of your basic, you know, just medical needs. And that, that Bichette's doesn't make you any less resistant to cancer, it doesn't make you any less resistant to heart disease or diabetes and so forth. So I think very important that you keep up with it. And I know it's very fatiguing because you feel like your whole schedule is surrounded by doctors. Uh, and so as a result, I think, but the basic medical care, mammograms, whatever the case may be, that still has to be done because most likely we can treat your Bichette's disease effectively. It's the other things that sometimes are missed. Okay, we'll keep moving then, thank you. Um, so here's a question about, oh great, we all love these, lifestyle changes like diet, exercise, stress management. You know, what can patients uh, do or make to help manage their Bechet's disease symptoms and improve quality of life? Well, remember, I said you're a, you're a victim in all of the Bichette's disease because you've done nothing wrong. Like we talked about the environment and so forth. And I always tell them, I said, look, you can, you can go crazy about looking for this, but the, what I call a healthy lifestyle is it has to be workable for you because we're also making it very demanding of you to take your medications, to follow seeing these specialists, to do these tests, and it's costly. And now we're going to ask you to say, okay, now you live a healthy lifestyle. So the problem is, it's, it's again, it sounds simple, right? So I think for most people, some people feel that a certain diet 
is acceptable and they'll try it and they'll stick with it and there's nothing wrong with that. But I'm not gonna tell my other Bichette's patients you have to follow that same diet because it worked on one patient. Again, it's very individual. Yeah, stop smoking, yeah, it'd be great. But realistically, in terms of maintaining a healthy lifestyle, I can't say because you were slightly overweight or underweight or you basically had two more alcohol drinks to drink, it's, it, that's gonna flare your Bichette's. You can't do that because we don't know the cause. So how can I sit there and tell you uh, you have to change your lifestyle? The other problem is changing your lifestyle is stressful too. If you look at some of these diets that people take, I say, oh my, I mean, I couldn't follow that diet and I'm a vegetarian. So I mean, like, my God, say, how can you do that? And people will do that. And sometimes they, and it's effective for them, but it's a major change in their life. So in your lifestyle, you say, can I do this? I want to try this. And as long as it's not, I clear it with my physician. And as long as no, it's not going to be harmful to me. You're not going to deprive yourself of something. And then you've got to follow it. And that's kind of a lifestyle change. And I try not to really push really heavy lifestyle changes. I know you're burdened already. And I don't have the science to say, yeah, if you do this, this is going to make you better. Yeah, I agree with that. And, and the approach that I often take, let's say for something like smoking, you know, I acknowledge that, you know, if you have Bichette's disease, you know, it's associated with depression and anxiety and, and you know, just the disease itself, uh, you know, exacerbates that. So, you know, we're going to have a, we're going to make a deal with each other, right? So we're going to start doing things medically to try to make the condition better, right? And so when, when your condition is better, you're feeling better, you're going to be in a much better place to then try to quit smoking, right? So it's not, we're not in there like trying to beat you over the head, stop smoking. It's, it, it's, a, it's a process, it's a, it's a partnership. Um, you know, moving toward an overall um, uh, better place in terms of your health. Um, you know, the other thing I think that's important, and I, I do keep an open mind about diet and different things, I, I just tell patients, um, you know, as long as it's something that's not going to make you unhealthy or malnourished, you know, some of these diets are pretty extreme. Um, when you talk about complementary and alternative medicine, so other vitamins and things that you might read about or, 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 uh, or uh, want to try, it's very understandable why patients look to things like this because you have a condition that people didn't diagnose for five years, right? And then once you get a diagnosis, you're struggling to find people who know what it is, and you're struggling to find a treatment from the medical community that works well, and that's tremendously frustrating. So it's natural then to turn and see, well, what else is there out there? What can I do? How can I control it? And that's not in itself a bad you know, idea or a bad um, thing to try to do. Uh, but the problem with a lot of the things that are out there is they're not, they're not tested, they're not studied, we don't know how safe they are, let alone how effective they are. Um, so again, I keep an open mind about these things. I'm not going to be dogmatic about, you know, don't do that, don't do that. But you, have, you do need to tell us. And we know in conditions like Bechet's, there's literature to, to, to show that um, a, a high number of patients are taking these complementary and alternative medicines. They are doing things with diet and other stuff. But um, the, the number that are doing it, it's a much lower number who are actually telling their doctor that they're doing it. And I think that's the key thing, um, so that we can be able to help say that, okay, th that is, that's all right because it does not interact with the other stuff that we're doing, um, whereas that one is a problem because it interacts, or that thing is a problem because it's going to lead to these other issues. So I think it's just mainly communication. I mean, we understand where, why, where, that, where that desire to, to fix it yourself comes from, um, but but if, you, if you can communicate with us, then we're in a much better position to help um, counsel you on that. And you shouldn't be guilted either in the saying, maybe somebody's a friend or, or a loved one says, go ahead and uh, you should do this or you should stop that. So I always ask my patient, what's your not negotiable? What's one thing that you're not going to give up? And then we'll work around that either because that sometimes is a problem where people are being punished because they're doing a certain thing. Yes, great. Okay, so Kathy, I think we're going to move on to the questions that you have some. Questions that have come in from the uh, live stream. I have one question from the live stream with, which aligns perfectly with the last question that our um, physician uh, panelists just responded to. Um, it, the question is, can my general health be linked to flare-ups of Bichette's sy symptoms? Yes. Yeah. So uh, we, we know that um, Bichette's disease is associated with uh, vasculopathy, um, disease of the vascular uh, system, whether it's arterial or, um, or uh, uh, venous, um, medium, small, large vessels can all be affected. Um, so, uh, and it may be random. So we may be dealing with some of that in the central nervous system. We may be dealing with some of that in the um, abdomen, in the chest. So uh, yes, your overall health can be affected by these things. Um, uh, inflammatory bowel disease can be subtle. 
Um, you know, when it's in the colon, we can see it with a colonoscope. When it's in the esophagus, the stomach, the upper intestine, we can see it with an endoscope. There is another 25 or 20 feet of bowel that we cannot look at directly unless we use a pill cam. So um, uh, these occult um, gastrointestinal symptoms often get you know, uh, pushed off as irritable bowel syndrome and dismissed. So yeah, I, I think that there are things that um, we don't see or we can't see well um, that do have an impact on, on overall health. There is a growing body of literature that says that there's a connection with the immune system and the neural nervous system particularly with regards to the, uh, when you talk about stress. We used to think that people would have stressful events and develop connective tissue diseases. I used to think that was just an association. This growing body of evidence, that's true. The problem is we don't know by reducing that, will that reduce the disease itself? So there lies the conundrum is that there is a, we're now recognizing the neurological relationship to the inflammatory uh, disease component of it, but reversing that, we don't know if that's going to help. Thank you. We're getting lots of good questions that are coming in, both from um, the live stream and from folks in the room. So I have another one here. Um, is Bichette's inherited? Well, Dr. Solich talked earlier about um, you know, the ge genetic predisposition, meaning you know, uh, a, a certain um, set of genes that may increase the risk of getting uh, Bichette's disease. But it's not something that generally, although you can have multiple family members um, sometimes who have Bechette's, it's not the typical uh, scenario and it's not something where, uh, you know, let's say you have, you're, you're a young person and you have Bechette's and you're wondering, you know, can I have children? Should I be worried about passing this on to my, to my kids? And, and we would counsel you that, you know, generally speaking, that's not something that we see, you know. Um, there may be genetic predisposition, um, but it's not like a direct heritable uh, disease in that sense. So major histocompatibility um, markers are just not as good for Bichette's as they are for some of the other diseases that we treat. Um, and as far as hereditary, um, even if you have a genetic predisposition for it, your risk for developing Bichette's may be increased. You know, if the, if the incidence is, is one in 10,000, right? Um, if you have the genetic makeup for it, it might increase to one in 200, all right? So if you think about that, if you have 20 kids, you know, chances are none of them are going to get it. Um, that's different from if you have blonde hair and blue eyes and, you know, uh, your husband has blonde hair and blue eyes, you know, your kid's not going to be curly haired with, with dark eyes. That's not likely going to happen. You know, if it does, you know, you got other problems. Um, <laughs> So, so it's, it's hereditary, you know, the way most people think of it is it's a little different. So the genetics have been uh, partially worked out to some degree in terms of the, what is the disease association in, in, in actually in, in, in Turkey. And what they found was that in, in the Turkish Bichettes, they found that this gene HLA-B51 is seen sometime between 50 to sometimes up to 70%. The problem is they also screened healthy people, and they found that 20% of those people who never got Bichette's had the gene as well in the general population. So having the gene is not, we don't use it as a screening mechanism because you could technically be very healthy and possess the gene and nothing happened to you. Great, thank you. Thank you all for that. We're getting more questions than we can actually answer during today's session, so please know that some of our speakers will be able to stay on during the break. Um, and then, as I mentioned, when we first began our program, we're going to be sharing all of these questions with our partners, the American Bichette's Disease Association and the Vasculitis Foundation, so that they can um, identify what topics you're most interested in and address them in future programming. So, Joyce, I'm going to turn it back to you for your final question. Okay. Thanks, Kathy. Um, so, if there was one tip or takeaway you would like summit attendees to leave with today, what would it be? Just one? It says one tip. <laughs> I would let you do many more, but I have my instructions. <laughs> well, you know, from my, from my perspective, um, you know, and, and the message I usually try to give patients that, wh whom I'm diagnosing a, a rare chronic disease is, is really, you know, the word hope, basically. So, like, you're, you're at this session right now. Like, this exists right now. So that means there are people who are interested. Um, that means, uh, you know, there are drug companies that are interested, there are patients and providers who are engaged in research for the disease that you have. And that wasn't always the case, right? 
Um, so there's hope there, um, you know, and, and, and there's studies that are being done. Not, you know, it's not even necessarily that the U.S. is, the, is even the leader. You know, there's studies happening in Turkey and, and other places where, um, where hopefully meaningful um, information uh, will be learned as, you know, as far as treatment and things that may materially change uh, the way patients with Bichette's are treated in the coming years. So, you know, I think, you know, really, it's a, that's what it's about. It's, a, it's about hope and, I think, um, awareness. And um, I think that, uh, again, some, you know, the fact that this is happening is sort of an indicator um, you know, that, that, that there are many people who think it's important, and, and hopefully in the coming years you'll, we'll, we'll see more and more of that. I think uh, one tip, if I were going to give something, is patience, persistence, and diligence. Patience, in, as far as, as, as doctors ask you the same questions over and over again, and you're just tired of answering the same darn question, keep in mind, with a disease like this, sometimes the answers to these questions do change, and they change subtly. So that um, when you think, well, it's all the same, except you know I've got more of these, and you know I haven't had that in a while, and you know, and once you start saying that out loud, it's like, well, I guess things have changed a little bit. So so be patient with those questions. They are important. They're dull. They're boring. Uh, they're monotonous, but they're important. Two. Be, um, be diligent. You know, make sure that you're giving the doctor feedback and you're, you're getting information from them. If you do communicate with somebody, you look up on the web, there's a new treatment, ask them about it. It may seem silly, it may be true, it may not be true, it may be dangerous. All right, so, so make sure that you talk about that. And then um, over time, you know, sort of map your progress. You know, how were you back in uh, 2015? How are you now? How are you going to be in, in 2022? You know, and sometimes it's a very small incremental improvement but, or, or, or deterioration, one or the other. But you, know, you want to track those things for yourself as well. So it's a partnership. You probably know more about Bichette's than some of the physicians that you see. Sure. So you have to educate uh, your physician about this disease. You're your own advocate, but always to be consistent with your therapy too. Uh, try not to you know, quote unquote experiment, be compliant being with your medication, unless there's a side effect that you have to bring it to the attention. But I think they, they, some people want to stop the medicine, see if it's gone away. Uh, again, do that in a controlled fashion because we always want to make sure because of a disease that sometimes wax and wane, important that we maintain that continuity of care. We're almost out of time. I, I just want to slip one thing in real quickly. Uh, uh, electronic medical record systems are allowing us to collect data that's never been collectible before and, and share that data. So little things like supplements or other medications, have, as they interact with disease, as they uh, improve disease, even in a very uh, marginal way, you know, we can actually get uh, uh, significant data that supports the use of certain things. So we, we're going to make some progress based on your input. So please tell everything that you're doing. Great. I just want to say thank you to all three of you. Um, thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise.